Welcome to the Grim Leftover Show with Grimnir every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern on reallibertymedia.com and rlmradio.xyz. Ah, uh, yeah, folks, it is a Monday evening here in RLM land and probably wherever you are, too. Uh, <laughs> anyway, welcome to the show. This is the Grim Leftovers program. I am Grim Nair. It is October 21st, 2019. This is episode 44 of the Grim Leftovers show, and we are live on reallibertymedia.com, rlmradio.xyz, realliberty.org. We're not live on freedomsnetwork.com, however. Because they, the account, the hosting account on Freedoms Network is currently suspended. Now, I've sent a message off to Bo, Bo Diddy, who owns the site. The site is hosted there under his name. And uh, I have not heard back yet. So uh, hopefully he'll get back soon enough and figure out why Freedoms Network got suspended. It's hard to imagine what, what might, might have happened there, but it is what it is. Uh, so we'll uh, we'll wait for that to come back uh, at us. However, we're also live on uh, Internet Radio, TuneIn.com, ShoutCast.com, and maybe other places as well. I don't know who all picks up the show, but thanks to all of you who do. Now, uh, if you're out there listening in those various places, come on over to RealLibertyMedia.com, jump on into the chat room over here, and talk to all the great folks that are over here chatting away. We do always have great folks over here to, to, uh, every night, uh, or every show, I should say. Well, every night as well, but there's not always a show going on. But anyway, I just uh, some of the folks I see in here chatting right now, we got Miss Kate and Mr. Trust No One, a.k.a. Rome's Vinny, or the Ponder Gander, if you will. We got Duh and Beetle and, and uh, Moose Girl and... Uh, we got the bots, Vanna White, and, and uh, the Weather Dork, and Barman, and other other bots. We got the Java Doctor here as well, and Frumpy, the Frumpster, uh, damn, damn, damn Van Meter. I think she's still around. I'm not positive. <laughs> she, she was talking a few minutes ago. So anyway, all the folks that are over there and uh, tuned in, welcome to y'all. Thanks for coming around to another show here. On this program, yeah, 44 episodes. We're we're getting up there now, you know, coming up on the on the year marker in December. December 10th was was the first show of, uh, last year, December 10th. So uh, we should be uh, hitting around uh, 52 episodes on on that date. We'll see. I think I missed one week uh, during the year, so um, due to a technical issue, not not due to not wanting to do it, but I had a technical issue one week, so. Uh, I think it might only be 51 weeks at the beginning of December there, so we'll see when it comes. <laughs> I'm not counting ahead uh, or anything like that. Anyway, hopefully you all had a good weekend and a good uh, Monday and are ready to hear some of this interesting, oddball, crazy kind of news that I line up for you all. However, however, I'm going to start off with some stuff that's not necessarily new and or old. It It is what it is. Um What's a couple of new ones in there in the middle? So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see how that all goes. But uh, let me do a little now thing there in the chat. In case anybody missed the fact that I was on there, sometimes people do. They're chatting away. They don't see what's going on. <laughs> all right. Anyway, um, this first thing I have for you is is a, is a, is a Ayurvedic mes- medicine, um, herb. And, and it's called ashwagandha. Now, I've been using this stuff, this uh, little thyroid booster, uh, thyroid support thing, because um, I, I've convinced myself over the last many years now that I have a, a low output thyroid gland. And so I wanted to do something to try and boost that up, get it going. And I ordered this stuff, and it, it seems to work okay, I suppose, um, from... Uh, uh, NutriChamp so, some while back because they, they listed it up there on a special deal and I got some and it, I guess it works okay I mean it seems to do something 
uh, as far as that. But it's got a bunch of other stuff into it, uh, mixed into it, be, be beyond the, the ashwagandha. So I, I decided this time I was going to go with a different brand here uh, and, and get the pure ashwagandha root powder. And uh, so instead of having the 350 milligrams that comes in the in, in the NutriChamps thing, I got these uh, 1,200 milligram tablets, and they'll be coming in this week. I'll tell you how they work after I get them. But uh, ashwagandha is what I'm going to start off here talking about. And as I said, it, it is an Ayurvedic medicinal herb, Ayurveda medicinal herb. Um, so uh, here we go. This first uh, piece comes from ayurveda-4u.com uh, Ayurveda is, it has a common name apparently of winter cherry or Indian ginseng ginseng um, the Sanskrit name of Ash, is, is ashwagandha which means <laughs> this threw me off a little bit but uh, <laughs> the, 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 the word ashwagandha apparently means the smell of a horse as its root, fresh root, smells like horse's urine, and is, and also perhaps because it is renowned for impairing the sexual stamina of a horse, meaning, yes, big like bull, except not bull horse. Um, <laughs> also known as, uh, I, I don't know if I can say this word, Vera, Vera Karani. Uh, it's frequently referred to as the Indian ginseng because of its rejuvenating properties, uh, although uh, botanically ginseng and ashwagandha are not related. So, um, the habitat uh, in botany, if you're interested in that, ashwagandha is a small shrub that grows to about one and a half meters tall. It's related to the tomato and has small yellow flowers that turn to red fruits, about the size of the raisin. The plant is native to India and parts of Africa and also the Mediterranean. Uh, the herb is considered an adaptogen, which is a non-toxic herb that works on a non-specific basis to normalize physiological function, working on the HPA axis and the neuroendocrine system. Ashwagandha is effective for insomnia, but it's not a sedative of any kind. It's a rejuvenative and, a ner and has nervine properties that produce energy, which in turn helps the body to settle and sleep. Thus, it helps the body to address a, a, a stress-related condition rather than masking it with sedatives. A herb that rejuvenates the nervous system erases insomnia and eases stress. Ashwagandha has also been shown to lower blood pressure and is highly effective in stopping the formation of stress-reduced or induced ulcers. In arthritis, which involves joints and painful, dry, swollen, and inflamed, ashwagandha would be the herb of choice. Uh, one of the special properties of ashwagandha is that it will enhance OHAS, O-J-A-S, or maybe it's Ojas. I think it's Ojas because I have that Spanish kind of thing going on. Anyway, Ojas is the most subtle, refined level of the physical body and is the end result of healthy food which is properly digested. It is responsible for a healthy immune system, physical strength, lustrous complexion, clarity of mind, and a sense of well-being. It allows consciousness to flow within the body. With decreased OHAS, we are less in touch with ourselves and more prone to diseases and having a feeling of disharmony. Um, Oja Kaishaya, which I don't know what that, how to say that, uh, means decreased OHAS, is a condition similar to AIDS or HIV, and you don't want that. So anyway, r research on ashwagandha has concluded that the extracts of the plant has a direct spermatogenic influence on the seminophorous tubules of immature rats, presumably by exerting a testosterone-like effect. Ashwagandha increases hemoglobin, the red blood count, and hair melanin. It stabilizes blood sugar and lowers cholesterol. Um, here's just a, a kind of a list of the properties of ashwagandha. Uh, the I'm not even going to bother with the ashwagandhic names. I'm just going to give you the uh, 
American English uh, translations there, increases sexual de desire, rejuvenates the body, increases strength, improves quality and quantity of semen, useful in, a man in management of white discoloration of the skin, useful in management of adamatoas, I don't know, uh, conditions. It helps clear impurities, ama, from the various channels of the body, useful in treating emaciation and other nutritive conditions. It has bioenergetics in, uh, built in there, a whole list of them there uh, for you to look at should you so desire. The biochemical composition of Wasania uh, saminifera has been widely studied and researched. Some 35 compounds have been analyzed in the laboratory. Uh, Anyway, it tells you how to how to what kind of dosages to use in the preparations, uh, none of which will matter if you actually use um, ashwagandha tablets. Now, I'm gonna I'm gonna provide you a link to this article, and uh, I have a, I have another one here for you, uh, which uh, may be more directly interesting to you, uh, and this is posted on Healthline.com, and it's the 12 proven health benefits of ashwagandha. It, so it tells you here, ashwagandha is an incredibly healthy herbal medicine. It is classified as an adaptogen, meaning it can, it can help your body manage stress. Ashwagandha also provides all sorts of other benefits to your body and brain. For example, it lowers blood sugar levels, reduces cortisol, uh, which is a stress type thing, uh, boosts brain function, which, hey, couldn't we all use that, and helps fight symptoms of anxiety and depression. So the 12 uh, benefits that they list here, it's an ancient medicinal herb. Ashwagandha is one of the most important herbs in Ayurveda, a form of alternative medicine based on Indian principles of natural hearing, healing. It has been used for over 3,000 years to relieve stress, increase energy levels, and improve concentration. Ashwagandha is Sanskrit for smell of horse, which we already talked about in that previous posting. Uh, the botanical name, Withania somn somnifera, is also known by several other names, including Indian ginseng and winter cherry. Uh, the ashwagandha plant is a small shrub. I've talked about that. Many of its health benefits are attributed to its high concentration of withanoldes, uh, which have been shown to fight inflammation and tumor growth. So all, all great benefits there um, right now. And then, uh, yes, it reduces blood sugar levels for those of you that have issues with that. So in several studies, ashwagandha has been shown to reduce those blood sugar levels. One test tube study found that it, in, it increased insulin secretion and improved insulin sensitivity in muscle cells. Also, several human studies have confirmed its ability to reduce blood sugar levels in both healthy people and those with diabetes. Additionally, one in, in a one-in-one four-week study in people with schizophrenia, those treated with ashwagandha had an average reduction and fasting blood sugar levels of 13.5 milligrams slash DL. I'm not sure what that is. Uh, compared with uh, 4.5 milligram in those who received the placebo. Um, so that's quite the difference there. What's more, in a small study in six people with type, uh, with, uh, type 2 diabetes, supplementing with ashwagandha for 30 days, uh, lowered fasting blood sugar levels, as effectively as an oral diabetes medication. Uh, it has anti-cancer properties. Animal and test tube studies have found that ashwagandha helps reduce apoptosis, which is uh, the program death of cancer cells. It also impedes the growth of new cancer cells in several ways. First, ashwagandha is believed to promote the formation of reactive oxygen species, ROS, inside cancer cells, disrupting their function. Second, it may cause cancer cells to become less resistance, resistant to apto, aptosis, ap, ap, apoptosis. <laughs> However you say that. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, animal studies suggest that it may help several other uh, treat several types of cancer, including breast, lung, colon, brain, and ovarian. In one study with uh, mice, ovarian tumors treated with ashwagandha alone or in combination with anti-cancer drug had 70 to 80 percent reduction in tumor growth. The treatment also prevented spread of cancer to other organs. Although there are no studies to confirm there's the results in humans yet, the research to date is encouraging. And it reduces cortisol levels. So cortisol is known as the stress hormone, uh, which uh, I, I may have seen some stress levels going up here. I'm fading in and out. Really? Uh-oh. What's going on here? Uh, ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. Oh, yeah. It looks like I, uh, the stream might have dropped there, but it should be back uh, at this point in time. So uh, I don't know what happened, but it looked like it, it dropped out for a second. Sorry, guys. <laughs> don't don't let that cause you no stress now <laughs> now nothing oh you should be there i should be there i, I should be on your on your your thing so let me let me make sure that everything is working uh let me go jump on over here for a second and check to make sure that everything is coming through i hear i hear grammy on the stream that is weird. What's going on here? Oh, I, I think. All right, all right. There's something. There's something messing up here. Okay, am I back now? Okay, if I'm back and I'm clear, then then, <laughs> then that's good. Let me try this again over here. See if I'm coming through. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know what's going on with that. I should be. Everything should be good to go. Um, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not seeing what's going on over here. Okay. Um, At this point in time, so uh, I don't know what happened, but it looked like it, it dropped up. All right, so it sounds like I'm back. So, yeah, don't stress the hell out. Um, <laughs> all right. Okay. <laughs> so, yes, this ashwagandha can reduce your cortisol levels and reduce your stress. Um <laughs> So that's a good thing. Um, so in, in, one, in one study in chronically stressed adults, those who supplemented with ashwagandha had significantly greater reductions in cortisol compared to the control group. Um, there, there's something going on here. I don't, I don't know what it is. Hang on a second here. I, 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 let me, let me um, I don't know what I'm going to do here. All right, just let me just stop this and close this. And I'll and I'll I'll try and restart that and see if that helps. Not that you're hearing what I'm saying, but uh, yeah, let's try this again. Okay, let's see if this helps. I shut down the uh, my broadcaster and I restarted it. Um, so hopefully this will fix everything up because I don't I don't need the, I don't need this thing dropping out on me while I'm doing this here. Hello hello hello. Okay, it looks like it's going. And it'll take a minute or two for that to get back up to you. So uh, hopefully that works and helps. And uh, maybe it was just a little glitch in, in the in the matrix there. I don't know. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, anyway, going on here um, with this, uh, it may reduce the symptoms of depression. So although it hasn't been thoroughly studied, a few studies suggest ashwagandha may help alleviate depression and i'm just kind of bullet point these here um it can de it can boost testosterone uh, and increase fertility in men so ashwagandha supplements may have powerful effects on testosterone levels and reproductive health in one study in 75 infertile men the group treated with ashwagandha showed increased sperm count in motility What's more, the treatment led to a significant increase in testosterone levels. So, uh, boom, shakalaka. <laughs> yeah, you know, the, uh, they don't want you to know about ashwagandha because it's, it, it's bad for the, for the medical industrial complex. Big Pharma doesn't want you to know about ashwagandha. Okay, it may increase muscle mass and strength. Research has shown that ashwagandha may improve body composition and increase strength. 
In a study to determine the safe and effective dosage for ashwagandha, healthy men who took 750 to 1250 milligrams per day of pulverized ashwagandha root per day gained muscle strength after 30 days. It reduces inflammation, uh, lower cholesterol and triglycerides if you're concerned about those things. Big one for me here, may improve brain function, including uh, memory. So test tube and animal studies suggest that ashwagandha may reduce, uh, reduce memory and brain function problems caused by injury or disease. Research has shown that it promotes antioxidant activity that protects nerve cells from harmful free radicals. In one study, and this kind of got me a little bit, epileptic rats, where are they getting these epileptic rats from? Epileptic rats treated with ashwagandha had nearly complete reversal of spatial memory impairment. Uh, this was likely caused by a reduction in oxidative release or stress. So uh, that, that's a big one for me. And uh, it's safe and it's it, for most people and widely available. Anyway, so that's it on the ashwagandha. I'll, I'll, maybe I'll put a link in the, in the uh, post show blog uh, to where you can get some of these supplements as well. Um, although you can find them easily enough without my help uh, there on that. So, uh, and hopefully the uh, stream is back and strong and everything's good, good to go. Um, so, cross your fingers. I'm crossing mine. Ow! Oh, <laughs> too far. All right. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know what the hell is going on with the stream there, but... Uh, at this time, it looks like it's going fine. So, uh, hopefully it is. <laughs> All right. This next article, which only came out uh, a couple days ago, but I, I wanted to report on it anyway because, well, I love apples, and I want to grow many apple trees, and I've started growing some apple trees. Uh, and, and I like a certain type of apple that uh, is called a honey crisp. A honey crisp is not... A natural apple. It was created in a lab uh, by crossing other breeds together. Now, you could call that genetically modified, but it, it, not not really in the way you think of GMO products. It, it, it's just a hybrid. But anyway, they, they 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 have developed a new apple, a new brand of apple, a new uh, breed of apple, I should say. I could call it a brand because it is going to be by uh, re, just by one certain people here for a period of time. Uh, anyway, this new apple, which is soon to debut at your grocery store, first ever bred in Washington. The, they call the new apple the Cosmic Crisp. It's not a video game, a superhero, or the title of a Grateful Dead song. It's a new variety of apple coming to the grocery store near you on December 1st. Cosmic Crisp is the first apple ever bred in Washington State, which grows the majority of U.S. apples. It's expected to be a game changer. What now? Now I'm gone? What the hell? Everything's fine. It's, the stream hasn't dropped out. Um, I don't know why I'm having technical issues here tonight, but uh, I'm going to just keep talking. And if 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 you have to go back to the to the podcast later on, sorry, but uh, <laughs> it's interrupting my flow. And we don't like interrupted flow. <laughs> so anyway, already uh, growers have planted 12 million Cosmic Crisp apple trees, a sign of confidence in the new variety. While only 450,000 40-pound uh, boxes will be available for sale this year, that will jump to more than 2 million boxes next year and more than 21 million by 2026. The apple develop variety was developed by Washington State University. Washington growers who paid for the research will have the exclusive rights to sell it for the first 10 years. The apple is called Cosmic Crisp because of the bright yellowish dots on its skin, which look like distant stars. Yeah, the honey crisp are awesome, but uh, uh, this is a new one. Finally, a new one coming along. So um, I'm not going to really tell you much more about it here. You can read this article, but uh, I, I'm looking forward to te checking out the Cosmic Crisp because <laughs> I, I really like apples, 
and uh, I hope hopefully my apple trees that I'm growing will 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 grow up nicely. Apparently, it takes a long time to actually get apples to go from seed to fruit. About ten years are some of the estimates that I've seen. I'm hoping for sooner than that on mine, but hey, you know, whatever. If I'm still alive in ten years and and I got fresh apples growing out of my yard, I got one tree right now that was here when I moved in. Um, so I get apples off of that, but it would be nice to have tons of trees growing, you know. I am live! Hooray! <laughs> Thanks, huh? All right. All right, and this next one is the last of the new articles, I should say new. Uh, and this is only going to be um, valid or important to those people still running Windows 7, as I do on this machine here, Windows 7. Now, the other day, I got a little uh, update thing, update notice, that there was a patch to install, a Windows 7 update patch. And and I went ahead and installed it. Then I was like, well, what does that do? Because it didn't seem to do anything. It went in really fast. And it was like, something fishy about that. And I went and looked it up, which I normally look up the patches that are odd uh, before I install them. So apparently, what this new patch is, it's not a patch, it's a thing to insert a NAG screen onto your Windows 7 machines that pops up periodically and tells you, hey, we, uh, Microsoft is going to stop supporting Windows 7 come in January. So you need to get it with the program and get it with the next version of Windows. And I was like, go to hell. So I went ahead and uninstalled it. Now, you don't necessarily need to go ahead and uninstall it if you've installed it, but you can check and see if you have installed it already. Um, and uninstall it, or uh, there are certain registry tricks you can do to uh, null it out, basically. Uh, anyway, the patch is called KB4524752. So um, you, you want to basically, if, if you don't like these pop-up things telling you something you don't want to know or already know, uh, there there is apparently also a button on there that says, uh, quit popping this crap up. Now, I prefer to just to get rid of the whole thing and don't have those things popping up on me. So, um, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, if you're still running that GWX thing, that'll get rid of it, too. But uh, there there it is. So, um, yeah, just, uh, just, just, uh, I don't know why they they said, oh, this is a, uh, what do they call them? Not the, uh, yeah mandatory patches or whatever they call them, important patches, which obviously it's not. So, anyway. <laughs> so, two questions for you. Number one, well, maybe I've got three questions. Number one, do you like horror movies? Number two, do you like Stephen King movies? Which are a subclass of horror movies. And number three, do you want $1,300? <laughs> now, my answer to all three is yes, but not really willing to go through what they they uh, they want me to do in order to get that $1,300. <laughs> so from ComoNews.com, this company will pay you $1,300 to watch 13 classic horror movies by Halloween. And this article actually came out... Uh, mid-September, but, and I probably should have shared it with you back then, but whatever. It doesn't matter, because it's, it's kind of not actually true. Because if a million people watch uh, 13 classic horror movies, you're, they're not paying out $13 million. Um, oh, okay, Rob doesn't like horror movies, or Stephen King. Okay, that's all right. <laughs> anyway, according to this, Horror movie fans, now is your time to shine. Uh, Udish.com is paying one lucky person $1,300, in addition to some pretty cool complimentary gear, to watch 13 classic Stephen King movies by the time October 31st rolls around. Don't worry about getting access to the titles. Dish will take care of that part, and you'll even get a flashlight, a blanket, popcorn, Candy and uh, Stephen King paraphernalia. The 13 spooky flicks you'll be tuning into are Carrie, 
the original or the uh, new, newer remake, Children of the Corn, Christine, Creepshow, Cujo, Dreamcatcher, It, the original or the 2017 remake, The Mist, Pet Cemetery, original or the 2019 remake, Salem's Lot, The Shining, and Thinner. Now, I have seen every one of these movies several times. I think I've only seen The Mist once. But all the rest of them, uh, yeah, I've seen all of these movies many times. Um, so these are the ones they, they want you to, to, to watch. Now, for some reason, there's, there's other ones that I, I might have included in the list, but they didn't include it in the list. Anyway, while you're watching, you'll be documenting factors like your heart rate using a complimentary Fitbit. <laughs> right, well, they're not paying more than one, <laughs> more than the $1,300. So <laughs> it doesn't matter. Anyway, who watched the movie, uh, who watched the movies with you? Your sleep patterns and more, which I don't want anybody to know any of that information. So I would not be doing this just on, on that basis alone. You're welcome to keep a journal to share all of the frightening details. If you are successful, or if you successfully make it all the way through 13 movies and log your experiences, you'll receive $1,300, assuming you, you are picked. So click here to apply, uh, and, and whatever. So, um, there it goes. Uh, there it is. And, um, I, I'm going to go ahead and say no, but uh, if some of you want to check it out, I, I mean, they're all good movies. Um, well, I enjoyed all the movies. Uh, good is kind of a matter of perspective there, so, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe not, not, maybe not the best 13 of Kings, but, uh, I, I really like Carrie, Children of the Corn, Christine, Creep Show, Cujo, uh, Dreamcatcher was so so. It was pretty good. It was, uh, the Mist was, uh, Pet Cemetery, I love that movie. Salem's Lot's good. The Shining, uh, Sinner. Uh, yeah, I don't really need to see Sinner again. <laughs> anyway, so just uh, sharing what I share with y'all. <laughs> All right. Now, according to EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, they have declared victory. Uh, how do they actually know you're watching the movie? Well, if if they are serving it up from Dish, which I assume means you need to have Dish, then Dish knows what you're watching when you're watching it. I I, I assume that's how they do it. I that's that all the details that that I gave you is all that's in that article. I'm sure if you go to the link, you'll be able to see more on how they actually know that you're watching those movies. But uh, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> victory has been declared here. Individuals can force government to purge records of their First Amendment activity. You mean like talking? <laughs> All right, according to the article here on EFF, which is posted on September 13th here, the FBI must delete its memo documenting a journalist's First Amendment activities. A federal appellate court ruled this week in a decision that vindicates the right to be free from government surveillance. I think you're kind of stretching it. I don't think that them deleting a memo means that you have a right to be free from government surveillance. You may have that right, but it's unlikely you're going to be free from government surveillance. And Gareth versus, matter of fact, I'll bet you this guy is far, under far more surveillance now. Anyway, and Gareth versus FBI, the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit ordered the FBI to expunge a 2004 memo it created that documented the political expression of news website antiwar.com and two journalists who founded and ran it. The Ninth Circuit uh, re re required the FBI to destroy the record because it violated the Privacy Act of 1974, the federal law that includes a provision prohibiting federal agencies from maintaining records on individuals that document their First Amendment activity. 
drink of water. EFF filed a friend of the court brief. Now, when somebody file, files as a friend of the court, I immediately get suspicious. <laughs> but that's me. Anyway, so they filed a friend of the court brief in that case that called on the court to robustly enforce the Privacy Act's protection, particularly given technological changes in the past half century that have vastly increased the power of government to gather, store, and retrieve information about the expression and association of members of the public. For example, law enforcement can use the Internet to collect and store vast amounts of information about individuals and their First Amendment activities. Like talking. Like me talking here. This is a First Amendment activity. You replying in chat. That's a First Amendment activity. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, Congress passed the Privacy Act after documenting a series of surveillance abuses by the FBI and other federal agencies, including tracking civil rights leaders like Martin Luther King and spying on political enemies by, uh, by R Richard Nixon. The law established rules about what types of information the government can collect and keep about people. The Act gives individuals the right to access records government has on them, yeah, good luck with that, and change or even delete that information. One of the most protective provisions of the prohibition against ma maintaining records of the First Amendment activity. Law enforcement was given a narrow exception for the records that are pertinent to and within the scope of an authorized law enforcement purposes. Of course, they, 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 they say everything is pretty much a law enforcement purposes because you are a criminal just by being who you are. Everything you do is a crime, so anything you do can fall within the scope of an authorized law enforcement purpose. <laughs> so, you know, there's a, there's, there's a little, uh, uh, wiggly room there for them to get away with this crap. As EFF's brief argued, the prescient fears of the Act's authors have proven true by 40 years of technological innovation that have given the federal government unprecedented ability to capture and stockpile data about the public's First Amendment activity. In reversing a trial court's ruling that the FBI did not have to delete the 2004 memo, the Ninth Circuit reviewed the language of the statute and concluded that the FBI did not have authorized law enforcement purpose for keeping that memo. Let's say anything about all the rest of the memos they have on antiwar.com, and you know they've got a bundle on antiwar.com. As the court explained, the Privacy Act's expungement provision defines maintain as maintain, collect, use, or disseminate. The court said that because the definition is broad, broad, it's endless, uh, Congress intended for the statute's protections to apply to all those distinct activities. Simply put, an agency facing an expungement claim under the Privacy Act must show that the record at issue is pertinent to an authorized law enforcement activity both during the initial collection of the record and during the ongoing storage of the record. Or, as the court put it, that is, if the agency does not have sufficient current law enforcement activity uh, to which the record is pertinent, the agency is in violation of the Privacy Act if it keeps the records in its files. The decision is a big win, they say here, in the fight against ever-expanding federal law enforcement surveillance because it provides a meaningful mechanism for individuals to force the deletion of records that document their protected Protected. <laughs> yeah, yeah, protected my ass. Protected First Amendment activities. This is essential in an era when so much political and social advocacy takes place online, as EFF argued in its brief. 
Now, let me just say that um, you you have to know, first off, you have to know that the documents exist, that they're out there, and and, and that uh, for, for whatever reason, um, they've been collecting this information on you. And they probably have no reason whatsoever other than the fact that you're on the Internet. And you being on the Internet means you're likely a terrorist of some sort. Uh, and whatever you say can be taken in any way they decide or want to to, to take it and produce information uh, and use that information against you in some manner if they so choose. So, and you never know what the, what the, what's gonna what's gonna ruffle their feathers and make them want to come after you. The thing is, every one of us here has records being kept by them, that were collected by them, that are against this Privacy Act. However, we don't know about them. So we can't go after them because we have no way of ha of, of getting access to that information. Uh, there may be a way to get to it, but it won't be easy and, and it won't be fast and, and it'll be a huge pain in the ass. And uh, even if you find one or two or 12 of your records, They've got thousands more. Yeah, whatever. So hooray for you, EFF, for doing something, uh, trying trying to do something. Um, I, I don't think it's much, and I don't think it's enough. Uh, we all know anti-war has been attacked on, on, in many ways on many occasions, antiwar.com, uh, because they don't like somebody saying they're anti-war. <laughs> they don't like anybody that says they're anti-war. Alright. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Where am I? Am I still going? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Alright. Um, so anyway, um, Halloween is coming up soon. And Halloween is the perfect time to roll out a boogeyman. <laughs> so here's a big boogeyman for you. Uh, this article was posted on, uh, when the hell was this posted? Oh, September 18th. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. So that, sometimes it's hard to find. On SputnikNews.com. Plague Incorporated in action? New pandemic. New pandemic. <laughs> May kill 80 million people across the globe, report warns. 80 million people. Oh, no. Pandemic. What pandemic? Oh, well, we don't want to be specific about that. <laughs> a fresh report, and, and you're going to love the groups that rolled this out, too. A fresh report by the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board, convened by the World Health Organization and the World Bank Group. <laughs> boogity, boogity, boo! <laughs> <All right. laughs> Wards that we are underprepared if a new contagion similar if a new contagion similar to the 1918 influenza pandemic strikes according to its experts it's well past time to act but what are you acting on if a new contagion you don't even know what it might be <laughs> The Global Preparedness Monitoring Board, the GPMB, tasked with providing an appraisal for policymakers and the world about their response capacity for disease outbreaks has revealed in its new report that the chances of a devastating global pandemic, devastating global pandemic, are rising. However, according to the body, which was uh, launched by the WHO and the World Bank, the world is woefully unprepared. For too long, we have allowed a cycle of panic and neglect when it comes to pandemics. We ramp up efforts when there's a serious threat, then quickly forget about them when the threat subsides. It's well past time to act! The annual report, <laughs> compiled by 15 public health leaders, says, noting that the threat of a pandemic spreading around the globe is a real one. What pandemic? 
The health experts warned that in the event of a pandemic like the notorious 1918 influenza contagion, 5% of the global economy could, 5%, 5%, could be wiped out and up to 80 million people could be killed. 80 million out of 7 billion. A quick-moving pathogen has the potential to kill tens of millions. What quick-moving pathogen? <laughs> has the potential to kill millions of people, disrupt economies, and destabilize national security. Who's national security? The, the report warns, pointing out that the contagion, the unnamed, unknown, unforeseen contagion, could spread within 36 to 50 hours to our well-connected world. Although the panel of experts admits that scientific advances have helped counter dangerous diseases, it also warns that there is a danger that new unknown pathogens could be created in laboratory environments. Wait, 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 wait. wait. Say that again. <laughs> We don't know what pathogens or diseases are out there that could create this global pandemic, but it says there's a danger that new pathogens could be created in a laboratory environment, meaning they're going to create it. <laughs> they're going to create whatever pathogen and spread it around the world. <laughs> So, so they know what they're talking about because they're going to do it. <laughs> Although they don't come out and say that, do they? All parts of society and international community have made progress in preparing to face health emergencies. But current effort, efforts remain grossly insufficient, the report noted, also slamming policymakers for a lack of continued political will. Now, I think it was the movie, Twelve Monkeys, where some guy working in a laboratory had developed a specific pathogen, and he was pissed off, well, for a number of reasons, but one of them being that people were not setting themselves up to be prepared for a global pathogen. And so he was going to take it upon himself to go out and spread that around the world, which he apparently did, which is why the society at that point in the 12 Monkeys movie were living underground in a uh, bio-sealed environment. <laughs> and they were trying to travel back in time and figure out who did it. Uh, anyway, poorer countries are said to be struggling to comply with international health regulations and lack support from the global community, despite, for example, the G7 pledge. Poverty and fragility exacerbate outbreaks of infectious disease and help create the conditions for pandemics to take hold. Acting Chief Executive of the World Bank, Axel von Trachtenberg, who is a member of the panel, said that WHO has urged world leaders to proceed with seven steps to avert, a, a.k.a. create, a possible crisis, including to monitor the situation, work out disaster plans, boost coordination within the UN, and develop preparation systems, among others. So, yeah, there's a possibility a probability, pot maybe, this new boogeyman they're talking about is uh, going to come into view, but only once they create it. <laughs> Boo! <laughs> Boo, I say. <sighs> what could you do? What can you say? All right, um... Shocker of not a shocker at all. From ZeroHedge.com, September 20th. Home Depot and Lowe's, your typical places you go to get stuff to fix up your home. You would expect nothing from them. It's just a home improvement store, a tool place, you know, some place you can fix up your garden, whatever. You go there and you get stuff. 
But what are they doing? Home Depot and Lowe's accused of scanning millions of customers' faces. Why there? Home improvement stores like Home Depot and Lowe's have become partners in Big Brother's ever-expanding... What the hell happened there? Big Brother's ever-expanding surveillance program. Uh, you, Home Depot's You Can Do It, We Can Help slogan should really say, We Can Do It, We Can Help Big Brother. And Lowe's Do It Right for Less, Start at Lowe's slogan should be saying... Do it right, and identifying every customer starts at Lowe's. According to the Cook County record, which is out there in Illinois, I'm pretty sure, Cook County, uh, two recent class actions accuse Home Depot and Lowe's of secretly uh, using facial recognition to identify customers as soon as they enter their stores. On September 4th, 2019, a group of plaintiffs simultaneously filed virtually identical class action complaints in Cook County Circuit Court in Chicago's in Chicago against Lowe's and in federal court against Atlanta-based Home Depot, accusing the retailers of violating the Illinois state law by surreptitiously scanning customers' faces as they moved about the chain stores. According to the Lowe's lawsuit, home improvement stores are secretly using facial recognition to identify everyone. Lowe's has augmented its in-store security cameras with software that tracks individuals' movements throughout the store using a unique scan of face geometry. Put simply, defendants, which they shouldn't be defendants, uh, surreptitiously attempt to collect the face print of every person who appears, appears in front of one of their facial recognition cameras. Uh, <laughs> no place is safe. The Home Depot and Lowe's cases claim that they have failed to inform customers of their biometric data is being collected and did not obtain written consent for doing so. Which... If you had to obtain written consent, which I think you probably are already are supposed to, uh, then people will just stop going to your stores. Home Depot and Lowe's have also neglected to post a publicly available retention schedule detailing when the data will be destroyed. Well, it won't be destroyed because they're already sharing it with the government. According to the Lowe's class action, defendants actively conceal their face printing practices from the public. The class action also claims that Lowe's has been secretly using facial recognition for over 11 years. There's no mention of how long Home Depot has been using facial recognition. So, at least since uh, 2009, I guess, um... No more than that, 11 years, uh, 2007. Have private corporations secretly turned in, turned America into China? I don't know how secret it is. Since when did it become okay for private corporations to secretly surveil the public? Uh, I don't I know. I think they've probably always been doing that. I mean, go to Las Vegas, they, they certainly have. But that is not the end of this privacy nightmare. Things get worse. I mean, a lot worse. Can you imagine two competing corporations sharing millions of facial recognition photos and descriptions of customers? Well, imagine no more, because it's happening right now. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you probably, uh, I, I, I mean, well, you can go to the, the mom and pop, Mom and pop stores are going to cost you a little more, but you're probably not going to be uh, surveilled and facially recognized, and that information sent off to the government for what? I, I can't even imagine. What? What? Why? Why? I mean, this guy bought a bunch of nails and a hammer and some wood. <laughs> He's probably a terrorist. Oh no, he was just building something in his garage for like furniture. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh my God. 
All right. This also from Zero Hedge on uh, September 20th. And I know we talked about this in the chat. I remember him laughing about it in the chat, but here it is. Aussie cops, those Australian cops, those down under, now confiscate loose coins from cars because uh, safety? What? <laughs> uh, this is posted up here on Zero Hedge by uh, Martin Armstrong, Armstrong of ArmstrongEconomics.com. I've heard what I thought was every excuse for government to raise taxes and seize money. But this is one I quite, quite honestly thought was something too low for even the police. Oh, they, they don't have a too low. The police have zero on the too low end. New South, New South Wales police have come up with the most bizarre excuse to steal your money. I never heard of. I never, ever heard of. They now claim that driver safety is the main reason for this new initiative to confiscate whatever coins you have in your car. They have the audacity to claim that loose coins within a car are a safety hazard. <laughs> a safety hazard. They claim that a driver may perhaps bend down to pick up a coin and get into an accident. What's next? They confiscate your phone and then sell it back to you after you're done driving? Australia has become perhaps the most aggressive country in Western culture to hunt down its own citizens for money. They follow school children and then investigate how parents are paying for the school. The Australian Tax Office, ATO, has applied for access to everything to hunt for money. They want to access to phone calls, emails, posts, and SMS text messages. Australians could face two-year jail sentences and fines up to $25,200 under proposed laws that limit use of cash to $10,000 a move some groups argue would create an Orwellian state too late <laughs> by giving authorities greater control over people's finances. The government slogan, cash is for criminals. <laughs> Even Orwell, I don't think he could have made this up. Cash is for criminals. Thus was hidden in the 2018 Australian uh, government budget, claiming it would save $5.3 billion by banning cash payments of $10,000 or more. Really? Uh, Australian Treasury, Treasury Secretary, uh, Treasurer Scott Morrison said it was a crackdown on the black economy. Well, now you're just getting racist. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of reform, they are reforming ways to hunt down their own citizens. Australia began as a penal colony. The king needed money, so just about anything you did, from stealing an apple to uh, any minor issue, landed you not in prison, but they would sell you to a plantation for five years and transport you to a foreign land and leave you there. If they could torture you and get you to confess to one of 240 felonies, they carried the death penalty, where the king could confiscate all of your assets and throw your family out on the street. Prisoners would die under torture to save their families. The king is dead. Long live the tax extortioner. Anyway, I'll let you read the balance of this, but... Uh... <laughs> I mean, really... <laughs> Oh, man. <laughs> okay. Where are we at? Oh, I'm already at the end. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to actually even read this next article to you. I'm going to give you the headline because it's pure, 100%. Un, un, <laughs> it's just propaganda. It's absolute propaganda. Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. 
Nine ways we know humans triggered climate change. And they're still basing climate change on this CO2 because they think that somehow CO2 is a heat-trapping gas, which we know it's not. And even if it was, it's 0.04% of the total atmospheric gases and it has increased basically 0.00001 uh, due to human activity uh, and it does not trap gases. Uh, and then they go on to other stuff, crazy, cra uh, just weird straw man type stuff. Like, it's like the smoking cancer link. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> uh, anyway, every, everything in this article is 100% nonsense propaganda. And it's posted up there by the Environmental Defense Fund, uh, EDF.org. So, uh, holy shit balls. <laughs> All right. And lastly, lastly, but not leastly, uh, hooray for Germany, I guess. I don't know. Is Oktoberfest still going on or is it over now? All right. Ger <laughs> it's posted on the 24th of September here. <laughs> German court rules that hangovers are an illness. Days after Oktoberfest. So a company accused of making illegal health claims about anti-hangover drinks, the court ruled that illness included temporary disruptions to our body. It ruled that hangover was an illness, so the company could not make healing claims. So they weren't going to say, okay, if, you, if you're, you're, you have an illness, if you have a hangover, except for the fact that they didn't want a company that was not approved by whatever medical board to, to say uh, that they were healing people of their hangovers. So, um, yeah. <laughs> I thought, not that their products don't work and do what they say. You know, um, I, I don't know. I've never tried a hangover cure. Um, but then I don't really drink, so uh, I, I don't see how that would be of benefit to me. All right, anyway, uh, that's going to wrap it up here for episode 44 of the Grim Leftovers program. Sorry about the technical issues along the way. Pick up the, the uh, listen to the uh, podcast once I post it, which will be very soon. Um, say half hour at the most. It'll be up there and ready for you to, to get at. Uh, and get on to the parts that, that, that you missed during the disruptions. Like I said, I don't know what happened. Everything else is working fine here. So, uh, <laughs> okay. Um, tomorrow is uh, In a Perfect World with Flash, possibly Grammy, possibly Vinny. We don't know, but Flash for sure. Uh, tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern, In a Perfect World. Uh, check the schedules up there on reallibertymedia.com for all of the rest of the shows that are available to you on RLM. And uh, thank you all for being here, being part of the show. Great to see you. Be back next week. Till then, peace.